It's a fun location. <laughs> I mean, it's actually like I feel like we're gonna have a really good interview in here. I'm staring at what it like. Oh, what you is have this like coat? he has like drapey things. There's I'm looking at like a black. I'm in Steven's section. Clo- so no, this is my mom's whole closet. Oh really? So, yeah. Oh, just kidding. I'm not in Steven's section. Please cut that out. Hey, welcome to Dip and Tail, baby. A casual conversation with professional artists. I'm your host, Sid Williams. Now it's recording. Perfect. Amazing. Excellent. Excellent. Hooray. We're here with Grace Roselli, and um, we're speaking to her in her New York City loft. You have a live work loft, right, Grace? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, in Williamsburg, and it's nice. When I moved in here, it was a big white box, and I was I needed to combine my studio and my living situation and have room for my kids. So I walked in here, and there's like 13 feet ceilings, and the the prices. While it's very expensive for me, and I'm grappling with that at the moment, you know, because my income, you know, is like this. Um, it's really cheap for what it is. Uh, it's a live work right in the heart of Williamsburg, up the street from the Bedford L, you know, mm-hmm. and it's about maybe 1,400 square feet. There's two sleeping lofts. There's plenty of storage, painting space. Everything I own is on wheels so you can move it out of the way. But yeah, those are my those are my canvases just kind of shoved there. And then I have a huge printer. I've got my spread. I mean, there's room in here. That being That's said, great. the only door is to the bathroom. So my kids, we all <laughs> open, you know, but it's it's well, worked, it's a ladies you know? palace. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's it's, Ooh, it's ladies great. Palace. Part of me, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to decide if I want to stay in the city or not. Yeah, you know. I might, I might take a break, maybe, maybe rent out my place for a few months and just, you know, I mean, I have kids. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, (laughs) you know, know, so one's going to be doing uh, online school sort of, but, but they're still trying to do it. It's LaGuardia High School and she's got an acting class. Yeah. Wow. She has to do. Grace, where are you from? Can you give us a little snippet into your life? I was born in Brooklyn. I was born in Bay Ridge. And grew up mostly in New Jersey, northern Jersey. My dad worked in the city. Uh, he was in the FBI. <laughs> so it was, it was interesting. Yeah, yeah. Was your dad intense? Was he, like, very strict with you? Yeah, yeah. No, he was super intense. I'm Italian. Um, not that that goes with intensity, but it was... Um, I'm the oldest of six. We're all about a year apart from each other. So it was a pretty condensed family. Um, my parents loved us you know but my dad's way responsibility was huge for him and he could get really manic his temper was a little crazy yeah you know and I mean I was born in 1960 so growing up you know my parents were of the 50s coming Mm -hmm. of age they didn't get the 60s uh counterculture stuff they weren't part of that they you know my dad was very conservative and super, super anxious that we wouldn't see any dark side, know about it, you know, I mean, especially from his work, he was more paranoid than anything. Plus he had four girls first before the boys came, Wow. you know, and for an Italian father, you know, the girls are something to be protected at all costs. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So, and I started probably manifesting art talent when I was around, 12. My mom was always into art. She always loved art and stuff. But, you know, she started having babies. Yeah. And again, because we're right on top of each other. And it was that time period. And my dad worked and but she loved babies. You know, she didn't love. I mean, she loved us as we got older, but it was always, you know, the babies. Yeah. She she was a she was a mother. Yeah. And then, the you know, because the sons were last. I mean, it it was I mean, it was really I, I remember when my first brother was born. We were living in Buffalo, New York. I think I was six. Yeah, he was the fifth one, so I would have been six. And I remember the whole block in Buffalo went crazy. It's a boy. It's a boy. (laughs) And I remember thinking, so what? You know? I remember my little self thinking, what's the big deal? You know? But then, you know, fast forward. So, like, I started manifesting art talent when I was probably around 12. And I could draw anything. I mean, you know, my hand-eye coordination was really good. So, and it was my way out. I was a shy kid. So drawing, you know, and and then I started getting attention for it, you know, and then 
my dad seemed like he was in awe of it. And my mom was always wanted to be that. So, you know, I got arts. It was all, it was all really great. I got a lot of support for technique, you know? Yeah. So when I started, when I started actually manifesting a voice, you know, like, like later on in high school, I remember it was a big no, no. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Cause I remember what, you know, you guys are probably too young, but there was this dance group. We grew up in New Jersey. My mom loved art. So she'd take us to museums and operas and stuff like that. But contemporary art wasn't a thing at all. I didn't know any other artists. My, my family, you know, they're, they're from blue collar. I mean, my dad, you know, his dad was an Italian immigrant. He worked on an ice truck. Then he got a gas station and, you know, yeah. um, and my mom, same thing. She grew up in Hester street. You know, her dad actually ended up being shot and killed on the Bowery at a poker wow. game. I wow. mean, yeah, he was, he was a Bowery bum ultimately. Wow. Um, no wonder your mom is an artist. She wasn't though. She wasn't, it wasn't the time for her. Yeah. She got married. She was yeah. a, she taught a little bit well, she an inside fought artist. to get an education. Yeah. She, but she, it was something she wanted and her voice, man. The woman mm. could sing, came up in the church. Mm. You know, she just had, you know, I remember growing up, everyone was always asking her to sing, mm. you know, and also Ave Maria's all over the place, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Ian, you have a question, go for it. I think that uh, I found the answer to it, but um, would you say that drawing is the first creative outlet that you gravitated towards? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It was, um, I didn't, I mean, I was always invisible. So, you know, because I was, I was, you know, I was a shy, and I think maybe a lot of that might have been because of my dad's temper. I was just, I wanted to be invisible, but you wanted to be seen, and then I'd start drawing, and all of a sudden everyone was like, whoa, mm -hmm. you know, but, and I'm growing up in pretty much a one horse town. Yeah. So, uh -huh. you know, it was a big deal, and I started, you know, selling some work early. People would come by, do album covers. Led Zeppelin was a big thing. There was one point where all these Wait, people Wait, what happened with, with Led Zeppelin? Back it up. Oh, no, that was that was a huge album cover that people yeah. wanted me to copy yeah. on, on their, like, jackets and stuff, oh, you know? Oh, yeah, 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 of course. And, and, like, then there were these things called funny cars, you know, those cars with the big wheels and they paint flames on them and stuff. Hmm. So, it, you know, so uh, in my neighborhood, a lot of these people, these had these cars and they realized I had this talent. So they're like, oh, my God, could you paint my car on my jean jacket? <laughs> you know, so. Amazing. And you went to yeah. art school, right? Yes. So then, I mean, it was just, it was a no brainer. I was going to go to art school. Again, my parents had no idea what an artist was. I didn't either. I thought, you know, because then around 17, I started getting very pretty, you know, and I didn't mm. understand that either, you know, and neither did they. <laughs> You know, and I thought I was going to go to art school and be a fashion designer, even though I had no interest. I mean, I thought you'd draw, you know, because all my female role models were in the fashion magazines, mm -hmm. not yeah. art. I was looking at fashion magazines and copying the pretty faces. And, oh, I want to be yeah. this, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. So then I got, I mean, I only applied to two schools, I think, a RISD and, um, I don't know, some other school in Philadelphia. I really wanted to go to visual arts or that school in Philadelphia. I wanted the city. And my dad was like, no way. You know, so I got into RISD and I went to RISD, you know, because he knew the head of the FBI in Rhode Island. So I had to have lunch with him. He was, he was a sweetheart of a guy. <laughs> you needed to be protected. Yeah, yeah, but that's why I went to RISD. And I mean, and they, they took out loans and stuff. I mean, my parents didn't have it like that. And I didn't understand what wealth was. Again, you know, middle class upbringing. And, yeah. and my parents, you know, they struggled to keep us where they were. But my dad, you know, he had that, he had a decent government job. And, but again, there's six of us. So, okay. So I go to RISD and man, was my mind blown. Mm -hmm. It was, I, I, I spent, I think one semester in illustration and I was out of there. I'm like, I just felt something more. I wanted more, but I didn't, you know, I'm not an until I, I couldn't articulate it in words. Yeah. Okay. You felt like school wasn't right for you. Like from the gecko? Well, no, no. I loved art school. I loved it because we weren't going to school. When I went to RISD, right. all you did was make art. I mean, they had one minuscule. And I think, at, you know, in hindsight, it was absolutely wrong. The period that I went, late 70s, early 80s, there should have been more emphasis on your intellect, on conceptual art. But I hit a patch where the teachers were just coming out of pretty much abex. What's that? What is that? What is abex? Abstract expressionism. Okay. 
somehow they skip the later movement. It, I didn't get those. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, and I was very physical. So it was all the physical stuff. So maybe it was the people I gravitated towards. And then I went into the painting department because mm -hmm. I was like, painting would just all of a sudden feel, filled something in me. And, and I was a natural. I could just slap that shit around, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. That being said, again, technique, you know, because at this point, I remember this, my, my intellect started, I wasn't thinking, I think I was starting to let myself get influenced by outside forces, let's call it misogyny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love you. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so my junior year, in between my junior and senior year, I got the RISD scholarship to the Skohegan School of Art and Sculpture. Do you guys know that one? Mm -mm. No, I don't. Oh, it's this, it's, it's a very good school in Maine. You look it up. It's okay. And people don't usually go there till they're a little bit older. But the year I went, uh, it was Milton Resnick, Ronnie Bladen, oh, Via wow. Selmans. Wow. Yeah. Alice Neal came for a visit. Oh. Al Loving. Um, <laughs> oh Raphael Ferrer came in. These people are huge. Huge artists. Mostly painters. Mostly painters. Yeah. Okay. Pat Pasloff. Like, oh, um, that's casual. Yeah. Yeah. I was too, again, I think my daughter's are not going to have this issue because they're New York City kids and and they talk. They it's post 60s different world. They you know, and social media is amazing. I mean, in some respects, but the stuff that I had to learn that I had to figure out in my 20s and stuff, that they're getting it now. Mm -hmm. So they they don't have to deal with all that, you For know. For reference points, how how old are your daughters? Uh 17 mm -hmm. and 22. Okay. Anyway, so at Skohegan, it was, I was very young. I mean, I was, I was already young going into college. So I was probably 19 or 20. And the median age was more 27, 30. And at that age, you're like, oh, my God, everyone's so old. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I think there might have been one person there younger than me that got an art scholarship from the school, too. Um, but Milton Resnick, man, you guys have heard of him? Yeah. I have not. Uh, Ian's like one I'm... foot in the art world, one foot out of the art world. Oh, okay. Milton Resnick's pretty well known. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, I, you know, I'm in this, all the cow barns, cow sheds are the studios. So I'm painting away and, and Milton comes in, Milton Resnick. And he's like, that's your painting. And I was like, yeah, he's like, <laughs> you know, like pretty good for a girl. Yeah. <laughs> what was the painting? I, I remember it was like of a skull. I was an early skull painter. Um, um and it was a very just, but it was a lot of paint. My, my work was always figurative, always, except for this stint. It was always had to be about something. I'm very literal. It's always story. That's why with the Pandora's Box project, you know, my project of portraits of women in the fine arts, it's literal. It's yeah. taking the faces of these women and saying something. It's almost like incorporating their oral history, kind of like what you're doing here with this. It's a form of oral history. Anyway, Milton, and again, I'm like eating up this attention from anyone, especially a guy, okay? Because mm -hmm. I think I incorporated a lot of misogyny. I think this is this sort of informed the trajectory of the rest of my life until I figured it out. I incor I was incorporating misogyny and in looking at art, yeah, because I'm incorporating this very male. I mean, you know, Milton was there with his wife, Pat. I you didn't pay attention to her. You yeah. paid attention to him. He was the guru, yeah. and he loved me, boy. You know, he, I think because the way I looked and, and the paintings. Yeah, you're just a, a young, eager woman. And he was very respectful. Anyway, I came out of Skohegan just painting like Milton, mm. walls of paint, hmm. just paint. And I remember going back to RISD and my painting teacher looking at it and saying, no, no, <laughs> ap, no. <laughs> and I did. Why do you why do you think your professor was like, this is like because it wasn't her voice oh. it wasn't my voice he knew i could do it i was good uh -huh. you know uh -huh. yeah you, you had your own voice you had what you needed to say not what milton taught you <laughs> gotcha yeah but it was also i mean i was i was a young woman and heavily influenced especially by the strong men in my life so you know so then going forward i got out of RISD, so no more use for school never went back for an mfa mm -hmm. and just you know walked out of art school Stayed home, I think, for three days with my parents. And I'm like, after all that freedom. You're like, absolutely not. 
and my parents. It was it was interesting because I love my family, so it was really hard try you know because I was a good girl. I wasn't. I didn't naturally try to rock boats. It just happened because of the way I chose to live my life. Mm-hmm. So in that family, you know, and my t- sisters and brothers to this day told me about how many boats I was rocking by how much they got screamed at when I was away, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> you know, like, like the race of my boyfriends and, you know, all yeah. sorts of different things that I would travel to and the, the paintings things that I would make anyway. So I get out, I got a waitressing job and boy, I was ready to take on the world. Mm-hmm. You know, I was ready to get painting. I got, you know, I got studio started, started working just everything. I didn't care about money. It was like whatever would take care of my rent, you know, so I would paint. But then going forward, I started realizing it wasn't my work. It was, it, it, you know, I had people telling me how to pay dues or, you know, all this sort of stuff. And I was ambitious. But then, I don't know, somewhere along the line, something happened. I think I started getting tired of, uh, you know, I think insecurity started coming in. I wasn't sure what I was doing anymore. And it started getting more and more female centric. I think it was again, cause I'm not intellectualizing this that much. I didn't have the conceptual framework to put it into words. And I started, I, I remember walking into the Strand bookstore in, in maybe was it the mid eighties? I don't even remember. And finding this book. For those, what is Strand? Strand is a, uh, it's a huge bookstore in, in like Union Square. Yeah. That is and it's been there forever. And it's been there forever, oh. and, and it's, it's like totally old. School. Everything you can get any book there. Yeah, and it's awesome. Sick. Yeah, I wasn't aware. And again, remember, there's no social media. I don't, yeah. you know. And when I was in school, art history was I think eight thirty in the morning, and it was Jansen. Jansen was an art history book that was all white guys, <laughs> and I think it stopped around Robert Ryman. Uh-huh. You know. Um, I think maybe uh, George O'Keefe might be in it. Maybe Agnes Martin. So no Ninth Street woman, that's for sure. Nah, I mean there might have been a mention, but again, you Guess know the what? art history class. I went class. to art history in I don't know when I I graduated in 2016 and went to art history classes 2014. No women were taught either, except well, no, Kara Walker was taught. Um, Are you kidding me, Sydney? No, I'm not joking. Art history is still taught the same way, Grace. Like I'm not joking. I didn't, I didn't learn art history until I started working for Dorothea, and she would tell you I absolutely do not le- know art history. My jaw is hitting the floor. I would have thought, seriously. No, no. Any of the textbook stuff is still same old shit. You know, the textbooks are expensive, too, so I bet so there's a lot of, So they're not reprinting you know. it. And also, it's like a systematic problem like everything else is. You know, textbooks are a monopoly. Yeah, that, there's so it, too. I... I Unless yeah. you have a really radical art history teacher. Um, <laughs> and I did learn some, like, uh, some things that I absolutely wanted to learn. That, like, I did a project on, like, Janine Antoni um, just because she was one of, uh, I knew her. Pers- like, I didn't yeah, know her she, personally. I just knew her yeah. work when I was, like, her 18 years amazing. old. It's I amazing. love her work. Me too. Me too. That living color performance oh, with her hair. I, I remember know. when I first, I was like, wow. Yeah. And I heard about that. So it yeah. was like, if you had any inner drive to look beyond what was in your textbook then you could pursue it but they weren't teaching you and you didn't have I didn't have the role models no there was one woman who taught technique in a winter session but my my teachers Mm -hmm. the painting teachers that pat I think I just really got a bad patch Hmm. um we're really just diehard painters and what one guy this guy what was his name Merkin Something Merkin, Richard Merkin. That's what that was his name. <laughs> and I remember him telling me once, taking me aside, and, you know, saying, "Grace, you know, you really want to succeed in the art world." He's like, "You got to dress up. You got to put on a show." I mean, maybe in a way there was something about what he was saying, but it was like telling that to a young woman who yeah. it's just not. It's hard. And, it's hard to hear that. Yes. So I was just used to looking at guys as artists. It didn't occur to me that women. I think I, I didn't question that there weren't women until I saw that freaking book by Carolee Schneeman, More Than Meat mm. Joy, that I found in the Strand. And I was like, what the fuck is this? Dorothy is in Meat Joy. <laughs> yeah, I know. She was, well, I realized that when I start, was doing some research on so her. So crazy. Research that could only happen because yeah. of the internet. No, it's true. And it's like, 
this awakening is coming from realizing that there's a lot, a lot, a lot of different realities um, and a lot yeah. of different truths. And you can build your own life with how much access to information you have now, which is really different for this is the first generation that can do this. Yes. And it's it is a sea change in everything, mm-hmm. you know, totally. Um, yeah. So, so I found that book. I started, I think, realizing I was a female because I think it was also finding that book. I might've heard of Carolee Schneeman before mm-hmm. and didn't pay attention. Someone said she actually came to the studio residency I was a part of. And I just, I totally didn't remember. Mm. It might not have struck me, you know, cause she was a woman. Totally. Um, and I was, I wasn't a woman. I was an artist. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> and I think by the time I actually found more than meet joy, I was starting to realize that I was a female artist that it was way too many studio visits where people were like, oh, her boyfriend was in the next room sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was stupid, you know, yeah. and I didn't have the personality to fight that because I didn't half realize it was happening. You know, I was a child of my time and again, trying to be a good girl. So, um, yeah. So I found that. and Oh, my God. And I, I did this one. Oh, one of my first painting shows. OK, I had a, um, it was in a gallery on the Upper East Side, actually where Gagosian is now mm-hmm. in that building, and Anita Friedman Fine Arts, and God bless her, she was great. I mean, she, 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 she loved me. I mean, she sold secondary, but she supported me. That's all you need. Yeah, and, and she didn't really do outreach for artists, and I didn't know how to do that, so not, my work didn't do anything except when her friends bought it or commissioned me to do portraits. But I did this one painting show that was all my nude body, you know, it was all self-portraits of me, you know, all <laughs> out and, you know, and I was starting to do a lot of self-portraits and painting my friends. We'd have painting parties where we paint each other different colors and then all, you know, nude and taking pictures and rubbing off on each other and all different ethnicities. And I mean, just everything that's always been in my work that's reflected now in a much greater scope mm-hmm. in the Pandora's Box project. So, and I remember my, my dad, they were so proud that I had an art show that could understand yeah. that. And it was on Madison Avenue and in the Upper East Side. So they brought their friends, all their, his FBI buddies. <laughs> and they came into the gallery. And I swear to God, I, wa- <laughs> I, wanted, to, I wanted to sink <laughs> through the floor. Oh, I'm sure. Wow. It was I'm sure. mortifying. They all came in expecting. I don't know what they, I don't know what I expected either. I don't even know. I must not have been thinking. And they all came in and they were all just like, this is nice, Grace. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, again, my parents, God bless them. They were, they tried. They could only, you know, I remember I sold a painting once for $60,000 through, it was the most I ever sold a painting. I didn't get all that money. Actually, I got virtually none of it because the woman that was doing that at the time, I just, they're all managed to be I business head. You know, I didn't, anyway. It seems, that seems to be like one of the oldest tales in the book. Artists getting robbed. Yes. <laughs> and, and I was my own worst advocate. Anyway, I was just so happy she was selling my work. Yeah. So I didn't question it. I figured there'd be more. Which I get. Uh, I get that. I get that feeling totally. Yeah. Yeah. But I remember they under, They were so happy when that happened, you know, but I was like, oh, this is the exception, not the rule. Yeah. When did this good girl image just for I mean, this is all audio. So people don't know what you look like, but you are like this badass woman in my eyes. You know, you the first time I met you, you rolled up in this awesome motorcycle like you are <laughs> like a strikingly beautiful woman with, you know, tattoos and just like this quintessential like bad bad girl vibe and and i have to say (laughs) when i when i first started looking uh into your work and i was checking out your website i was i was really interested in the fact that you have made uh motorcycles such a like huge part of your life because i love motorcycles i don't think i'll ever have one unfortunately all the women in my life um, are, was raised by a afraid. lot of Jewish women. They're afraid of the motorcycle. Uh. Like there's a there's a big thing of motorcycles and fear. Well, with good reason. Yeah, I don't know if my youngest daughter, my 17 year old, has manifested desire to ride. Honestly, I, you know, I okay. The reason I started riding the motorcycle. All right, I had a whole bunch of boyfriends. You know, in my 20s. Mm-hmm. 
you know, yeah. you live in the art life and working and, you know, having sex and working and, have, you know, all that sort of stuff. You know, it's all fun and great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I always loved motorcycles, you know, and I had this boyfriend that had a motorcycle. Man, he had this motor guzzi and it was so sexy. Oh, my God, this bike. You know, and I'd be riding behind him, like holding on to him, and his stomach muscles were awesome. And, <laughs> and <laughs> you know, good. so this kind of also coincided with a part of my life. I think I was 27, 28, where I realized I had way too much physical fear. You know, I already had a fear of authority, and I, and I was starting to realize I had a fear of showing people my work. I started to have a lot of mental fears. Mm. But I and I was getting tired of the physical fear. I had somehow let a lot of insecurities come in. So I was starting to become invisible again. All this mm. early confidence I had was starting to dissipate, and I was trying to fight it. And I could fight it physically. That's what where I could control that narrative. I got a pit bull. I got a. Um, <laughs> so you started going towards things that frightened yeah. you. Yes. Uh-huh. And I'm riding over the Brooklyn Bridge one night with my boyfriend. And, you know, we had just come from a party and he was very coked up and drunk. And he kept looking back and telling me good luck. Oh, geez. And I mean, I I have to admit, it took me a minute to realize I did not have to be a passenger. I went out the next day and I was like to this boyfriend, I'm like, you come with me. I'm learning to ride a bike. Mm. I bought a 500 CC CX 500, you know, a 78. and, And this was in 88, 87. So it wasn't. I mean, it wasn't that Mm -hmm. old, but it was $350 and I bought that damn bike and I went and I I took a lesson because that's all I had the money for was a lesson. And it was, yeah, I'm not that coordinated. So it took me a minute to learn. I mean, again, I'm thinking if I had to think about this, (laughs) (laughs) you know, and again, at this time, it was still a little lawless in the city. Because I didn't have a license either. I would just put a cardboard plate on the back of the bike and just say my license plate was stolen. And nice. and I was a cute girl. And they there weren't that many women riders. Mm. I, they were unicorns. I didn't run into any. I really, it's like I kind of came out of left field. Um, and I had a really lovely upstairs neighbor's neighbor. And I think about this now. Because he, he would get on the back of my motorcycle. He knew how to ride. And he would direct me. Oh. So he kind of taught you. Yeah, by doing. I'd be on the bike with him on it. And it was a big bike. You know, I I mean, a 500cc Honda, 78, that's a piece of metal. Mm. It's not the light bikes they have now, you know. So, yeah, and I just never stopped riding. I just realized I loved it. It was the best way to get around the city. You know, you didn't have to deal with subways. You had some power. So that's where all that started. And I started lifting weight. Yes. Oh, cool. <laughs> you, know? you were becoming one with iron and metal. I did. It's like I'm looking at my my soon to be 60 year old body and I'm watching, you know, I hurt my arms. So I can't I used to do a ton of push ups. Mm. I'm like everything's starting to I mean, now I'm just doing stuff to maintain gravity somewhat. And that's <laughs> so is is fitness still uh, a, a part of your life? Yeah. It is, but not as much as it was. I can't stand working out. I probably, I do YouTube videos now in my place with my daughter. Um, You know, I actually, the man that I married. And that's kind of an interesting story. You told me, I told me a little bit about the the man you married and had your kids with. Oh, yeah. Isn't he, he's Moroccan? um, Yeah, yeah. What's his name? Zuer. Zuer, Luhaichi. My children's last name is Luhaichi. He's from Casablanca. Oh. You know, we, I mean, we romantic. actually kissed and made up the beginning of this pandemic. I was like, we, we've been battling for so long. I'm like, I can't do this anymore. Mm. This is stupid. Mm-hmm. You know, so he's actually, he's a, he's a really nice guy. We just had no conversation. I mean, he was a very, oh, he, very good looking man, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> not anymore. And yet, you know, oh no, he, he no, he still is. It's just, I'm not, it, you know, <laughs> no, but, Ian's um, just pushing buttons I'm just, over there. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> he, you know, you, you guys, my, I don't know if you guys ever go to Balthazar, but he was like yeah. the mater d' there forever. And I remember I used to go there to watch him smile Aww. while we were married. Because somehow Aww. when he got home, the smile left. Um, <laughs> but he, 
<laughs> but you know, you know, having having kids and all that stuff could do it to I mean, no, he loved his he loves his kids. He's got a great relationship with his daughters. But anyway, so so and he had a motorcycle and I met right. him at the gym. Oh nice. Oh nice. Nice. I you know, it's interesting you say that. I uh I, it, it sounds to me like that's kind of really what you were getting into as like a side passion at the time and I, I feel that like being interested in th- just things and pursuing activities for those things solely is a really great way to just like end up end up finding someone else that is interested in those things and it's like you start you have a bond um because you, bo- you both are interweaving your passions um, um i i just i just find that it's a it's a way that most people i feel like don't start relationships these days because of there's so much opportunity online to meet someone it's like it's it's that's really a big part being interested in other things is really a big part of i think forming relationships um that maybe this generation these, gen- lacks. these generations yeah like yeah our generation the ones above us anyone who grew up with uh social media you guys might be romanticizing that a little bit. Uh, <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did I tell you I was divorced? Anyway, um, <laughs> well, well, I, you know, we had, we had the motorcycle. But again, it was more because I wasn't, I didn't look for someone who was interested in art. I didn't, you know, all the art boys I knew were pretty terrible. The ones I was meeting anyway. There was a lot of ego. Uh, and there was a lot of ego enough said, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I met Zawara, not that there wasn't any other ego, but he was, he was very exotic. He was good looking and he was into the same physical stuff I was into. So what was not to love, you know, it was very physical, you know, and then, um, and my, my dog, that pit bull got me in a lot of trouble, (laughs) you know, we had some issues and I ended up, um, because I didn't know what I, I was, I was really being stupid, but I ended up going to Pennsylvania and getting, getting out of the city for a little bit. But then, you know, my boyfriend would visit me and then, you know, so I came back in pregnant and then I was like, okay, you know, <laughs> I, I never really had the desire to be a mother. It just wasn't anything I even thought of, mm-hmm. you know, until I got pregnant. I was like, all right. And, and he was like, he was like, all right. I'm like, all right, if I have this baby, we got to get married though. Cause I need health insurance. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so he was like, all right. So I got married, had the baby, yeah. you know, and then I had another one and we, we lucked into a house in Harlem and, you know, we had a, we had an interesting 10 years, but in the middle of that though, uh, this is physical exercise. Okay. He started getting into triathlons. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is Uber exercise, Yeah. you know, and I was, and I was, my studio was in the basement of the house and I just wanted to, you know, in between taking care of two young yeah. kids and the, it just, it was hard. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think even though, you know, his his family was it was also his family while they were all lovely, they just kept coming. Mm. You know, and they would stay for really long mm. amounts of time. I mean, we had some kick-ass parties. You know, I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, we had a party. Uh we're on 118th Street in Harlem. This would have been 19, no, it was 2000, maybe in two, my older daughter's three-year-old birthday. We invited everyone on the street. It was a whole mix of different kinds of families. Um, and then my, my husband brought in uh, these Algerian rye singers, RAI musicians that he knew. Hmm. Oh, my God. This party was this mix of Arabic people, the belly dancing, the, you know, the artists and the people from the block up in Harlem, some of whom had been there forever. Okay. That's amazing. And it was, it was great. It was amazing. We'd go to Morocco for a lot, you know, for like over a month every year. And it was just, it was, it was different. It was interesting until it wasn't when I really started getting tired of it. Probably nine 11 happened right in the middle. Mm. And I know I started getting the feeling that he felt he was, you know, he was sleeping with the enemy. I was American. And I think there was a big uh-huh. Arabic collective feeling of guilt again, this is just me trying to make thinking sense about it in hindsight. Yeah. Um, but I know things started to shift. He started getting into triathlons. So in terms of physical fitness and meeting yeah. someone at the fucking gym, no way, never again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. At least with social media, I've never gone on a dating site. Mm. I have been tempted Neither and some of I. my friends Neither have. I either. 
Really? No, I've never oh, signed up for Oh, because it seems anything. like you could put down what you're into. Boom. It's all right there. I think it's not that simple. I wish it was. I learned recently that uh, all of like the dating sites will match you with people that are in your league. Yeah, but like it's they like, already assign you a league, and then right. you can only see the people that oh. are like in your hotness scale. It's very oh dear, way more muddy than you think. Yeah, it's like it's like all of the apps are talking to each other, and they're, they have all learning. Like, they're yeah, learning. They from record all the other how apps. lonely you are, and when you're on it, they record your conversations. It's just like a oh Jesus! So the algorithms. Yeah, it's yeah. A, it's an algorithm. Wow. I didn't real so it taking on the worst aspects of the already the kind of the prejudices those the that clickishness whatever yeah it's just perpetuating yeah. superficial life yeah yeah wow so and then people yeah. are like afraid to meet people in person and with COVID it just I think our generation is a little bit like um I mean we're both in relationships so I can't really speak in the dating world because I didn't really date so yeah, much no, before I, I met Glenn either. I did not do modern dating. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I met huh. Glenn at like a music festival that got canceled. And I met Kara, my my girlfriend, through a film club that we were in at college. So we met at college, actually, like right at wow. the end. Wow. Wow. I know. Huh. <laughs> <It's> great. <laughs> you it's won't great. Talk, see, there's still, there's still old-fashioned ways of getting together with your significant other. Right. That bar scene probably isn't there as much. No. I mean, there's no phys- there's not really that much physical space to meet people anymore either. There's no, yeah. like, writing clubs or painters club. Like, there are, but you have to really be in the know. It's not like, it's not like New York used to be. It's what I'm understanding from stories of, you know... Dorothea. Nightclubs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I wasn't really big into bars. I didn't go to bars that much because I worked in them, you know? Yeah. But man, like not, the nightclubs were, you know, were amazing. The gyms, I mean, the, yeah, just walking around outside. The 80s I mean, gym scene must have really been something else. It's just the like, late 80s. Late 80s. Yeah. I mean, it was fun. You know? Yeah. But also, I was sure. in my 20s. I mean, what wasn't, you know? What wasn't fun? <laughs> Yeah, toys are fun. Seriously, what isn't? <laughs> yeah, everything should be fun at this time. Things work. <laughs> before I had the before I had the motorcycle, you know, I had to have my transportation. I had roller skates, you nice. know, so I was roller skating Amazing. all over the city. I was a big rollerblader, like when really? I was younger, but uh, like ramps and stuff. And uh, I, I like, wow. I, I would s- skate at this. Uh, basically, this dude would. Uh, make he would set up ramps and have like a makeshift skate park in the the basement or in this like lower gym of this high school in maplewood and i would go like every weekend um and i just like learned to drop in on ramps and and fly over like boxes and stuff so yeah rollerblading i love that it was such an awesome thing so grace when did this idea for the pandora's box project start and what was the catalyst to interviewing all of these women and especially intergenerational women why was that important to you okay the motorcycle project that i did that was kind of the catalyst okay i've always taken pictures as photo reference okay for my paintings and which Mm -hmm. were always figurative you know again i'm literal i like stories i'm not good at making things up so i would always have reference I mean, I would make up the worlds Mm -hmm. that the people were in, but I needed that reference. So, you know, I'd get better and better at photography just by doing it. And then so, you know, I I get divorced. I, you know, I'm in a studio, I'm painting, you know, I'm starting to do photos. And then this this woman that I was working with for a while, we were going to do a show at her space in Westport, Connecticut. And I showed her the photos I was going to use as reference for paintings because she'd been selling my paintings to various designers and stuff. And um, and she's like, no, the photos are awesome. Let's just do the photos. And I was like, really? And we blew them up big. I mean, I, one of the photos was like eight feet long wow. by like four feet, three and a half feet high. You know, it was a face. It was gorgeous in, in her space, you know. It was really nice. She sold it for a nice amount of money. I mean, it was... This wasn't the art world that we're familiar with, you know, it was yeah. uh, a little different. Well, Westport has a little bit, more, like, it's different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how, is, how is it different? It just, like, has more money. It's just different uh, money. It's different it, it, money. It, it, different it's, money. It's, it's, 
a different mind. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't the critical. Mm, I, I, I'm not sure. It, it's like I'm, I'm going to sound very classist to myself, so I w- won't even go there. It just it wasn't the audience I was used to, okay. or the audience that I wanted for my work. Okay. But but she was providing me with income. Yeah. Which wasn't from waitressing or catering or faux finishing. It was from my work, mm-hmm. and it was like whoa so i was like yes please whatever you say so that's when i started taking photos seriously and then you know that that relationship imploded and maybe it was around 2014 before it really imploded i was like you know i'm gonna take a trip and i want to take a motorcycle trip so i signed up for a tour in the swiss alps because it was around it was what i could afford and because i didn't want to go by myself i wanted you know there's actually these motorcycle tours and and it was the time that I could do it. So it was like Dr. Dude a little. I went, you know, online and I was like, well, what could I do? And I found this. I was like, all right, Swiss Alps tour. And it, oh my God, it was a week in the Swiss Alps on a motorcycle with this group of people. It was the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. Oh my God. <laughs> what type of bike were you riding? Ooh, uh, it was a Beamer. It was the first time uh, I had heated grips. Oh, okay. Nice. The bike I have now is heated grips. I will never do another bike without heated grips. Nice. It rained the whole week. Oh. And it was the mountains. It was the Alps. Oh, my God. And oh, yeah. there's those, you know, I'm an urban rider, and there's those things, those switchbacks. Mm. And they're insane. And it was raining. Did I mention it was raining? Yeah. I was just thinking, like, this sounds like the least ideal weather for a motorcycle trip. And I'm thinking, I spent all my money on my dream trip. And it's raining, and I'm going to kill myself. There was one point where we went to the top of a mountain, and you know those clouds that you see ringing the mountains? Mm-hmm. We, we went through those clouds. Oh, I couldn't yeah. see the person in front of me. And it was so, that was, that was the most terrifying thing I've done in my life. But I could see him because he was fluorescent. And then we got to the top of the mountain, and there was a, there was a restaurant. Oh, <laughs> and amazing. there were all these Italian sports cars. And all these Italian dudes, and they're like, go down the Italian side of the mountain. There's no rain. It's beautiful. Ooh. The, the roads sucked because they were in Austrian, <laughs> but it was gorgeous. It was gorgeous out. Anyway, so I get back from that, and I'm like, I'm looking around for, I didn't want to paint. I wasn't feeling painting. And now I have all this photo confidence, and I'm looking at all the women I'm riding with. I, I had done a project called Naked Bike. Which uh, I really but- love, by the way. I think it's Thank really you. But, you know, the origins of that project actually were before I got married, I was living illegally in Dumbo at 68 J Street. I could take my motorcycle right up into the freight elevator up Ooh, into my space. Ideal. And there was a guy that like a designed spy. like, yeah, painted bikes Seriously. <laughs> on one of the floors. And I got invited to be in a show. I, I co-curated with um, Babs Rheingold, a show at Franklin Furnace, one of the last physical um, shows they had before she moved into archives and Pratt and then they Mm -hmm. sold them. Martha Wilson, one of the first people I asked to be in my project, hands down, is just amazing. Collecting that performance art, I mean, uh, okay, riding a motorcycle to me as an artist too, it's performative. It always felt like I was performing female on that bike. Mm. So when I did the first iteration of a naked bike. I didn't, again, I didn't have the intellectual underpinning. I was invited to be in the show by Thomas Lanigan Schmidt at the National Arts Club. This was 95, 96. And I was like, could I do a video piece and a collaboration? He's like, sure. I'm like, I'm going to do a piece on motorcycles. So I invited this performance artist named Jocelyn Taylor to be in it. Jocelyn, she, I met her through doing the show at, at Franklin Furnace and she calls her, she's Jaguar Mary now. That's, that's her, her new, her new persona, her new self. And, but at the time, the first time I saw Jocelyn's work was at Jeffrey Deitch because he had a huge gallery and she was in his project space, but she's like this, she was a six foot tall, uh, beautiful, dark skinned black woman, gay. It's all about those identities. She walked down the street. This is pre Beyonce smashing windows and Pippalotti <laughs> wrist and Jocelyn walk down the damn street, just a video of her walk, just herself walking mm. nude down Canal Street. Mm. And it was just, it was freaking amazing. So I asked Jocelyn, you want to do this video with me? 
you know, I want to do something on motorcycles. Why don't we, you know, we're going to ride around and ask people what sex their bikes are, <laughs> nice. you know, because bikes are very sexualized. And then I asked, I, I needed to design the bikes too. So I noticed that my motorcycle making friend, Scott, was redesigning gas tanks in the shape of women's rear ends, you know, Ooh. so the bikes, you know, the guys could lean in, <laughs> you know, you'd have this butt right wow. here and you'd lean into your, wow. yeah. Oh, I never thought about that. I like it. <laughs> yeah, you would, Ian. <laughs> but, and they were actually, you could ride the bikes, okay? And I was like, Scott, I'll put you in this art show with me and Jocelyn. We'll do a trio if you'll make me a male version, you know? So I'll have a female version oh, and a male nice. version. That's right. <laughs> yeah, oh my God, me and Jocelyn made the penis for the male bike and we made it erect. And that's yes. why the male bike, you couldn't ride it because it was uncomfortable. You know, you had this thing right <laughs> because we made it the size we let, you know? <laughs> There could be an accident. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I put Jocelyn on the back of my bike and we ride to bike, you know, bike rallies and stuff and just asked a whole bunch of people, what sex is your bike? And that was the video. And then the motorcycles were in the show with their, their, they were human, you know, and then we put little videos of like me, Scott and Jocelyn, because we were each very different. Scott was uh, kind of mixed ethnicity. I think he was Native American, black, white. I mean, he was a whole bunch of stuff and a guy and straight. So then we, the three of us sat on my motorcycle and did a video just switching places, like who was in the driver's seat. So it was kind of metaphorical. It very cool. Is there anywhere I can see this? <laughs> Does it exist? It. it exists. The pictures. Oh. <laughs> okay. Very it's, cool. I think on my Instagram account, I did post pictures early on, maybe a few years ago, of the bikes themselves. But that uh -huh. was the first naked bike. So okay. fast yeah, forward. Okay. And no social media. Um, right. And I do have, I'm pretty sure I've got those damn videos on tape somewhere, but me and all my moves and record keeping, you know, yeah. who knew, right? Yeah. Uh, it's a full-time job archiving. Well, yeah. It, it, at the very least, you know, it, it happened, it existed for the people that experienced it in that moment. And it, it sounds uh, got reviewed like too. something. Oh, yeah. wow. All right. So it exists in a couple Bill of different Arning, forms. Bill Arning, Jerry Saltz, Kim Levin, they all, you know... But I mean, they were like, it's a mess, but it's, you know. But it's a beautiful mess. It sounds yeah. really cool. <laughs> it was it was fun. But again, no social media. I wasn't, the three of us weren't really promo oriented. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was that. We all went on to our things. Anyway, so fast forward, I get back from the Alps. I'm looking at all these women I'm riding with. The Misfires. It was a group called The Misfires. Oh, yeah. I just read about this. Yeah, it was the first motorcycle club I ever joined. I was like, because my next door, one of my neighbors, again, I'm coming out of a marriage. I'm, I'm getting back on the bike again. And, you know, she, she rode up to me and I'm like, oh, hey. And she's like, you know, we actually have a female motorcycle club. Why don't you join us? So I went and I met all these women, all kinds of, you know, Williamsburg, Brooklyn, all artists and film, you know, all kinds of women. There's an explosion of women riders now. I really like the design of uh, the the helmets. I don't know if everyone has the same one, but it's kind of like, it's like a skull. It like looks like a skull and it has like a face shield. And I just remember being like, oh, wow, that's really cool. I don't on, on my site? Oh, with the, I, lo I was looking at the Misfires, uh, I guess, Instagram oh. page. And I just, I was- The Night of the Living Dead. Yes, yes. We would do the ride. No, the ride of the Living Dead, Halloween. We do our helmets. I did, I did the coolest helmet. I had this thing kind of flowing out of the back and Viking skull. Yeah. I really love that design. <laughs> no, it's great. Anyway, I met them and then I'm looking around and I'm thinking, huh, I wonder because it still seemed, you know, and, and we'd all bitch about the same old, like what, what comments you would get as a female rider. Cause even though there's an explosion, it was interesting. There's there's a lot of guys that are amazing. No problem. You know, but there's what happens when you leave the gender neutral territory of this motorcycle? A motorcycle is a motorcycle. It's a vehicle. Mm -hmm. But we all know it's not just a motorcycle. It has this. It's got place, personality. Romance. It's it's associated with all kinds of things, but not necessarily with women. Unless you look at Richard Prince's girlfriends where it's trophies, you know, the, it's show me your breasts and the motorcycle. Yeah you know, uh, trophies for the guy. Um, anyway, so I was like, well, what happens if me as the photographer, woman, rider, 
Ask each of these women, what happens when you take your gear off and walk into female? What does that look like? And that's what Naked Bike started. I showed it at Motor Girl, which is a female-owned garage in Greenpoint, because what better place yeah. to do that? I mean, the, the, the opening, the community. I'm sure it was magical. It, it, was, it was great. It was packed with bikers and artists and it was, it was fun. Like a good scene. Yeah. Yeah. It was like the perfect place to do that. Coming out of that, you know, I'm like, okay, so I've been riding motorcycles and avoiding the art world. I'm like, maybe I should go back into this art world that I've always wanted to be a part of. And I just never did. Mm. And then I realized I didn't know anyone anymore. I was going out with this dude that had a uh, residency. He was teaching a class up at this thing called Castle Hill in Truro, Cape Cod. Okay. And I was taking pictures for him of the, of the people doing their work in the barns. And, and my pictures come out really good because I've been doing it forever mm-hmm. and I've got a good eye. And then one woman was like, yeah, you should do a book, Grace. And I'm like, I should do a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. How these things start. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I didn't really have the idea of a Pandora's box. Until I got into it and realized what I had. So it started as simple as that. Brenda Goodman was the first artist. She was up there as the visiting artist. And she was a friend of my, you know, of the guy I was out going out with. And I was like, Brenda, could you do this? And she's like, sure. And I got this great picture of her. And then when I got home, I called up the women that I knew. I'm like, will you be in this project? You know, and then, and I was like, could you recommend other people? Mm -hmm. And Dorothea. I met her at a party. She actually, I reached out too cold. Yeah. Um, I met her at a party, a Christmas I party that years email. ago. That was you. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. So, hey, there it goes. Mm-hmm. See, um, I was at Roland Flexner, whom I'd known forever, at a Christmas party. And I was talking to Dorothea and I just, she, she was, I loved talking to her. And I just always remembered that conversation. And I'm like, Dorothea Rockburn, let me reach mm-hmm. out to her. So Roland gave me her info and I reached out and you guys responded. Totally. Sometimes it, you know, it's, it's very interesting how to get responses and a lot of emails get lost and, and it, it just and sort of meandered that to, way. Like, it's hard to reach out cold to anyone, especially someone of a high caliber or an older artist where you don't even know if they check their email. And then I remember when you rolled up to the studio in your motorcycle it was like Dorothea this woman's badass like this is gonna be a good day (laughs) you know and it was a good day and then we became in contact and it was great I mean your project is super inspiring and I think that's why people are gravitating towards it Yeah. yeah that was that was the beginning of it and then I realized after doing these pictures and talking because what I love and this is why I never recorded because what I love is um, I love talking. It helps me see my subject by talking to them. And also, you know, I do my research just to sort of get an idea because I didn't want, these aren't headshots. I'm not, you know, photographing work. I want something of the person to be reflected. That's why at the beginning I was like, hands have to be in it. Mm-hmm, you know? I remember that. So for the first 50 people, <laughs> yeah. they were like hands. Yeah. And you were, man, Sydney, you were great because you were like doing handstands and yoga was so much, that physicality was so, yeah, I love that picture. You know, so um, a lot of these pictures now I need to go back and tweak because there's now that, you know, again, after doing this, For so long, I've learned, I've gotten, my skills have grown too. So now I want to go back and it's like going back into a painting. The image is there, but now, you know. um, So, yeah. And then I realized, I was like, oh my God, this is an incredible moment in time where, I mean, Pandora's box covers the scope of 60 years. There is a polluted river of misogyny and racism that runs from the 60s and 70s, up through here, right up through the explosion of the gender binary at a time where it's not man and woman anymore. It's all these rainbow shades. Mm-hmm. And I have a hard time keeping track of the names. My, da- my, my daughter, they, I'm always, you, mm. it's okay. Pro- te- pronouns yeah. are still hard for me to do. But, oh, my God, do I love it. Mm-hmm. I wish that they, them was a different word, though, because I get that mixed up with plurals. Yeah. But then again, it makes sense, too. I mean, it's like, oh, my God, it, 
this this is an amazing time. It's a um, real sense of so all these women are existing together. The reason I could find half these women is because of social media. Without social media, I wouldn't know that Eleanor Anton existed. Mm. I wouldn't know half the women that I'm reaching out to. The websites, the the visibility. Is you know, Lois Dodd um, still your oldest artist? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, she's, she's still the oldest. Yeah. Am I still your youngest? No. Damn. No. Damn. You, you just lost that. It's fine. No, low. I'm nobody. <laughs> 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 no, there's a woman named Miriro Wandibaya. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, but she's from Zimbabwe and she's in Switzerland. Okay. And I did a Zoom portrait with her. Oh, I just cool. posted those on the website. I'm calling them pandemic portraits because once the pandemic hit and I couldn't do portraits in real time, I'm like, how am I going to do this? And then one of the women in the project, and I imagine, you know, as we all get older, it will happen more and more because life happens, whom I just love to pieces and I didn't have enough time to really get to know. Helene Elan died. The first two weeks of COVID, she mm -hmm. got it, died, underlying conditions. Um, and I was like, I cannot stop doing this project. I got to keep this moving. So I'm like, how do I do this? You know, and I was on a Zoom call, I think, it um, on this website called Art at a Time Like This, Barbara Pollock and Ann Verhalen, who are in the project now, too, in those pandemic portraits. But it was like, you know, Michelle Handelman, another artist in 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 the project <laughs> was on a zoom, you know, with chatter in the beginning. And she's like, Grace, why don't you just do computer portraits? And I'm like, Oh, please. And then I was like, Oh, not please. a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> no. And yeah. And I, I started, I made it work, Yeah. you know? And at first I, I was like, do I do screenshots? Do I, you know, I'm like, no, no, let me do this. Anyway, the scope of the project is insane. It's all of us are together here. Now it's the only time in history. This is going to be like this. And it's, I remember a time when I was in art school and I did not have role models. Mm -hmm. These women in the 60s and 70s did not have role models. Mm -hmm. You're telling me that you're in your art history book. They're still not doing a lot of women. No, I didn't read Ninth Street Women until after I left Dorothea Studio. I mean, I, I, I didn't know. Yeah. I, and then I'm very, very, very fortunate that my first steps in the New York art world were that big show with Dia. Um, which is Jessica Morgan, Alexis Lowerly, like you, Heidi Giannotti, yeah. all everyone at Dia that I worked with, uh, Courtney Martin, all of those curators, art handlers, Jessica Morgan's the director, everyone was female. Like my whole existence in the New York art world was female and that was just like amazing. I felt so received and I felt so respected and I, I mean I like had um, so many people that I was like oh my god goodness like I look up to you I aspire to be yeah. this Dorothea had female friends um my sister worked in development at the New York Studio School so that was another female in the world I really like I was washed over with women and that was like I, I mean I feel incredibly blessed wow yes Ian I'd like to go back to what you said about role models and I was curious if you who of uh, are some of, oh, I'll just re-ask this. <laughs> I'm just curious <laughs> who some of your role models are and if you have ever met any of them. My role models, the, the, the people that I would get influenced by. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's so many older women that I think are amazing, but a lot of them, I'm just learning about them now. Mm. Um, I'm going to say I have a whole project of role models. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. I started Pandora's box because I felt some kind of I mean, obviously it was a lack. I don't think I really ever had in my 20s. I was too busy with all my boyfriends. I didn't really have female friends. I mean, I've got some great female friends. Amazing. But they're not, you know, they're not in the art world. It was. It's also hard because when you're a token item, like, you know, a, a lady in the 80s in the art world, there's a lot of competitive energy amongst females. And I think like... Women. It was... Fucking terrible. Yeah. I, I, I put my foot in that a little bit. Plus, it's like, fuck, man. I was good looking, man. That was like. Yeah, you get, she's, you get she's cut She's stupid. Up. She can't, you know, and I don't talk that well. So I just got like, I got eaten up and chewed out. Wasn't the, t wasn't the thing for me. I couldn't, yeah. you know, there's there was a lot of guys in the art world. They didn't have to have the ability to speak. But as a woman, you needed to come to the table with so much more. As a black woman, they needed to come to the table with like. 
I mean, fucking everything, man. You know, I mean, it's just, it, it was what it was. And I didn't, I wasn't the kind of personality I was already battling with a lot of insecurity, so I didn't have that fight in me. I, I, I thought that the problem was me, mm-hmm. not everybody else. What I admire, oh my God, the women now in the project, Dorothea, Pat Stare, mm-hmm. these women that have all stuck this out at this point, I have nothing but admiration. Everybody that, um, so I think growing up, I'm trying to think of role models. At, <laughs> You know, I think I was listening to whatever stronger person than me was around, usually a guy whispering my ear in my ear about my art, Mm -hmm. you know, so like, I think my work looks like a group show, Mm, you know, that's a really interesting comment. Yeah, because I could, again, I could do anything. So for me, technique wasn't the problem. It was, um, I lost my voice somewhere along the line, Mm. even though my voice has always been a woman's voice it's oh it's that's the one thread i always fight back to that Mm -hmm. it was always about the body it was always using this but again i didn't have the conceptual underpinning i never fought hard enough for that i never realized it was something that was that important Mm -hmm. you know i i had kids i i just my mind i think was always too busy yeah Mm -hmm. and now like doing this project and i'm just like i'm giving myself an amazing education that i never had it's amazing. I love I love seeing this project and learning artists that I don't know. Um, it's kind of like an encyclopedia at this it's, point. So it's just been like it's cool to see it grow. It really is. It's cool thanks. to see how things are inter like interwoven, interweaven, interweaved, interwoven, uh, inter intertwined, intertwined. There's 150, 160 women in it right now. I would like ultimately for there to be about three or four hundred. I think that feels like a real like a Noah's body. Ark. Yeah. Yeah. I can't get what everybody in it. Oh, that's a good goal. <laughs> oh, Sydney. That's I'm here for you, Grace. Sydney. Have I told you before that you're freaking brilliant? Aww. That's 360. <laughs> is it? Oh my God. That just sent shivers down my spine. That's the number I'm going cool. for. Wow. Cool, that's cool, what I'm cool. going that's for. That's cool. Yes. That that feels like a circle. It's the collective. It's a 360, baby. Yeah. The beginning when I started this, when I realized what it was, that I that it was this this timeline, this narrative, this like you know, the people that came of age in the second wave of feminism. I'm gonna yeah, actually I love my paragraph. I'm gonna read it. brings together a magnificent group of women in the fine arts, crossing eras, demographics, geographies, and races. Artists, curators, collectors, art dealers, art writers who came of age during the second wave of feminism and the social revolutions taking place in the 60s and 70s through the present, encompassing the growing hyper-accessibility afforded by social media, rise of a female support system. Huge, huge. Women need to be bigger collectors of women. And there are a few that just collect women. And there's more. It's like women riding motorcycles. It's exponential, okay? Um, the, the rise of a female sports system and the explosion of the gender binary. You know, I mean, shit, women beginning art practices 60 years ago, or whose work was often appropriated, dismissed, treated as less than the art of their male peers are today working alongside the subsequent generations of women who grew up with technology, role models, and platforms for their art that didn't exist before. I mean, this is, it, it's I, the historical scope of this. I've always thought about this pretty much from the beginning that it's kind of an anti-monument mm. you know it's not actually one of the women in the project Meredith Bergman was commissioned to do the statue the historical statue that is going up in Central Park the idea of a monument especially especially post I mean not post is in the time of Black Lives Matter yeah okay where monuments are being ripped down Mm -hmm. every monument 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 you know i'm like anti-monuments that's what a collective is a monument is not a statue meredith is doing a statue that commemorates women and and i'm like i'm not sure if i agree with the idea of a statue it seems like an old system what is a new system for monument what does that mean because monuments have such a bad history and they seem to be coming out of uh, 
people that shouldn't necessarily have been heroized. It's always a collective of people behind somebody that's mm -hmm. making that person, that's pushing that leader. We need leaders. We need someone to pull it all together. We need a president. Not this president. No, not even, a, we, you know, you need someone that it's just, it's managerial. Yeah. You know, I, I even see it doing this project. It's like, I, I wish there was someone else to take up the parts where that aren't my strong suit, no. you know? It's that collective. I'm not, I'm not proud. It doesn't need to be just me. I, I need someone else, you know? It's, it's the piece itself that needs to be made. Totally. Um, so your past work pre-COVID was really hyper-realistic where you could see every pore on everyone's face in your photographs. Since we're forced to social distance and you've adapted your portraits to Zoom um, and they're a little bit more grainy and gritty, even in commercials, you can see that everything's a little bit more grainy and gritty because it's filmed via Zoom or Skype or whatever. Um, do you think that the art world technically is moving towards this more grainy, gritty viewpoint out of this hyper-focused realism? I think in the art world, there's always opposing forces. Things go one way, then they bounce back. And everyone that was doing the other way of working is always going to exist, just not paid attention to. I did those portraits the way I did them because I, I was shooting them with my good camera. I'm standing in my studio shooting my computer screen. <laughs> That's so bizarre. You know? It was so weird. Yeah, it, but, but it, mirrors, it mirrors the spirit of the time. And I tell you, mm -hmm. I don't have, you know, this is a labor of love. I don't have a budget for this. And it's a brilliant way to not travel. Oh. <laughs> like, for example, this is how I could do Mariro who's in Switzerland via Zimbabwe. I'd love to be in Switzerland, but you know, hey. So I'm in, at the mercy of someone else's camera. I had one woman in Brazil who did Skype over her phone, you know? Uh, that's why I started leaving in a lot of the, the lights that are around the Zoom calls and stuff, because it shows process. We, we want touch. Mm -hmm. We want real, you know? You don't want just this manufactured, just even what you were saying before about dating algorithms, yeah. okay? We're human. This is an art keeps you human. It asks, asks those hard questions. In a way, I'm very, this, the pandemic has showed me in a sense too, that the, 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 the reality, um, what am I, I'm actually just coming up with this now. It's like, wh what is human, you know? What's, what's important about being in real time? I mean, every photograph I take is not real. It's mm -hmm. all, it's all subjective. I navigate subjectivity immensely in this project. This is why I need to talk to people before I shoot them, because I need to see who they are again when I'm looking at the pictures I shot. You know, Gains it helps me I decide, yes, which is the picture, which is the picture. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I, I don't think that's all. I think it's going to be a huge mix, but absolutely computer work incorporated. There's one woman in the project, Stephanie Dinkins and Janet Biggs. Stephanie is specifically working with robotics to change the algorithms. She's a black woman working with the underlying algorithm of what's going into the language of robotics and AI, wow. which is huge. Cause look at what's starting to happen in the date, just on your dating site. Who's making those algorithms? How is that happening? It's almost Darwinian, maybe these algorithms. Someone's got to program the algorithms. So that's already biased, but then it's also who, the, the algorithm that gets the most play. Well, it's also like 5g and facial recognition. Like there's like a full genocide happening in China with the Muslim people. Yeah. It's a yeah, lot it's, of things. There's like thousands of images being, there's more millions, billions of images being taken every day. That is just like making us less human and more yeah. like just data. And that's, and that's, that's the artist's job. Yeah. To keep us human. Yeah. To keep us to our priorities, to slow things down enough. This is why physical work is never going to stop because we're physical. Yeah. We all still have sex. I don't know, yeah. maybe in 3,000 years from now, if we're here, yeah. which doesn't really look like we're going to be, you know? <laughs> well, 
Oh, well, hopefully. Hopefully. I know. <laughs> oh, my God. I would love to time travel. Shit. I would love to time travel. I don't know. I, I don't know about time yeah. travel. It seems like a slippery slope to go down. I, I guess I would like to time travel, but I guess it's it's like motorcycles. There's a huge element of danger. Which has never scared me. Yeah. I've seen too much Rick and Morty to want to time travel. I've been watching this show called Dark, and it's it's German, and it's... Oh, it, that just right. That just came out. It's it's in Netflix. It's really good. It's super intense, and I don't know. Time travel after watching this show. It's time travel is uh, questionable. Scary. <laughs> it destroys worlds. It destroys people's lives. Um, but but interesting time travel subject. With, uh, time travel without consequence. Oh yeah, in a perfect world. Where would you go, Grace? A thousand years in the future. Oh, that's what I, would I want to see. I want to see what happens to the world, and I want to travel to where my kids are when I'm not here. I want to see what happens to mm. them. Oh, so those two things. That's why I want to time travel. Okay, well, to. those are those are those sweet two. answers. But it's also all my work, except for maybe this project, Naked Butt. I mean, it's all been informed. I love science fiction and fantasy. Mm-hmm. I mean, the the authors, uh, shoot. Margaret Atwood, Ursula K. Le Guin, Octavia Butler, N.K. Jemison. I mean, these women in my life are huge. I mean, starting from when I was a kid reading C.S. Lewis, The Chronicles of Narnia yeah. and The Hobbit. Yeah. All right. It's, it's these worlds. For me, this was my way of traveling, mm-hmm. you know, because, you know, as an artist, you never have any freaking money. You don't go anywhere unless you yeah. take all your possessions. You sell a painting. You get lucky. You, you take a trip. You know, or you say, fuck it, and you take a trip. Or you just put yourself in a lot of danger, Yeah, which is hap- yeah. happens. It happens. I've done yes. a lot of stupid things that I definitely should never do ever because I was like, I need to get from A to B and I have no money. So that usually involves some th- form of thumb in the air. And I'm not, a, I mean, I promised my mother I would never hitchhike again. Like a hitchhiker? Like yeah. A, like you hitchhike yeah, somewhere? That's <laughs> some strong I, guardian angel. It's a, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've had a lot of, I've had a lot of uh, luck. <laughs> yeah you just you think about that yeah. right? oh yeah in hindsight i would never do like i took a three-month euro trip um and i went alone and i would just not do a lot of the things i i did i would do a lot of the things i did ag- again but i i went to greece and we couldn't leave until we made enough money to leave maybe i would go with enough money to go and come back next time that could be problematic <laughs> yeah <laughs> so. i have a question that i just thought about actually um, it's kind of off topic, but I really love that uh, Batman Catwoman painting you did. Um, Batman, I love Batman. Yeah, I was just gonna ask: Do you like Batman? Are you? Did you read comics growing up? Is comics part of your influence? I, I love the idea of Batman. I started that project because uh, this artist named Andre Serrano was a, a friend of mine, and his girlfriend Irina. I, I learned that they were Batman and Catwoman for Halloween. I was like, oh, my oh, God, Andre, great. you have to let me photograph that, please. And he's like, okay. So that was them. Like, So the, that painting was a, a, a photo of That's, them. Yes, Andre Serrano. Do you guys know who he is? I don't know I, who I, he no, is. No, I don't. I bet a lot of people listen to this don't know who he is. Piss Christ, Knife of Wars. Karen Finley, 80s, um, started a lot of a, a lot of the reason why defunding for the arts started to happen oh. was because of Andre Serrano. Look it up. Look okay. up Chris Christ. I will. I Interesting. will. I was born in 94, so I missed a lot. Art history. No, but this is, he's, it, this is, yeah, he did rats, like suicide photos. He went down, photographed the Klan. Okay, Whoa. I'll definitely look up his work. It sounds yeah. really definitely, cool. Definitely. You know, he's a little into, I think, like s and I mean, he's on that edge. Um, but yeah, no, he's, he's, he's an important artist. Okay. For sure. Anyway, that's, that's him in that painting. Did you ever watch Watchmen or listen to Watchmen? Yes. Or read the comic Watchmen? I didn't, not the comic, but I, I love either. the, um, you know, what upset me about that? What really upset me um, was that I had never heard of the Tulsa, Oklahoma bombing. I'd mm. never heard of that for that yeah like blown away i remember a few times i've had some guys say to me how could you ever talk to another guy again you know and i'm like i'm looking at my my friends of 
color, and I'm like, how could you ever talk to another white person again? That show, but they, that, did, they did a great job with that show. They really did. They really, they really did. I only saw one episode, but I was captivated all the way through. I, I loved the series. I didn't see the movie, though. I haven't seen the movie. I think that it, they're completely two different they're things. They're different. They're definitely yeah. different. I think I started to see the movie, and it was very superhero-y. Yeah, it's very much based on the superhero yeah. narrative. Yeah, I get I get tired of the superhero things. Yeah, because it's usually a group of five. They're usually in their early thirties, so you know, and it's always it's it's the demographic mix. Every superhero movie now is the right demographic mix. It's like yeah. this. one blonde girl, one you know, one. You know, it's funny. I've never really liked any of the superhero stuff, but I I grew up loving Batman. It's like Batman. Yeah. Batman well, is is just different. I think it's probably the vigilante side. Yeah, and also he wears he's got the cool costume. Yeah, he's a bat. I mean, he's come a bat. on. I and you I know? also loved bats growing up. <laughs> no. And also when I was looking at Batman, because then the series I started doing was. Well, if you push down the ears, this looks just like a hijab. <laughs> you know, this is post 9-11, yeah. so I started taking a lot of pictures. But I didn't, I didn't continue it. I, I just sort of lost touch with what I was doing. I might go back and refigure them, mm. but I got too vague and it got flabby, mm. so I stopped. I have a question, actually. It's a materials question. Oh, then go for it, Ian. Do you hear, do you hear her little man in the back? I do. This dog is beautiful. <laughs> what type of dog is it? He's a cane corso. Oh, oh, what color? Yeah, he, he's black. Uh, he's yeah. actually. I've met you, one. If you ever watch Game of Thrones, you ever watch Game yeah, of Thrones? Yeah, is he like the dogs yeah. that eat Ramsay Bolton? That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But he's a he's a sweetheart. <laughs> I was in Australia and I was like at a beach. I was at a skate park with my friend, and uh, I met a guy who was walking two of these dogs, and he was trying to sell them. And I was like, I I can't take this dog from you, but. It's a beautiful dog. He was just walking oh, down yeah. the street trying to sell Connie yeah. Corsos. I guess he lived in the what area. What was wrong with the dogs? Yeah, no, <laughs> no, they were they were puppies. I guess he's a uh, breeder or something. Oh, oh, but there must have been those. The dogs are, are considered a rare breed. They're a little expensive too. It's not like a dog you see. It's not like a dog you prance around and try and sell on the street and try to sell on it's the street. It's a one of a kind. Something doesn't sound right. Yeah, so I wouldn't. Something was wrong. I wouldn't say he was yeah. prancing around. Or he either stole them, or he was. Um, That's awesome. Maybe. Very but you know, anyway. Oh, sorry, sorry Ian. So what's anyway. your materials? Oh, sorry. <laughs> my, my materials question. I notice in a lot of your work, you use this. Uh, I would describe it as like aluminum webbing. You use it to surround uh, subjects' heads, their forearms. Uh, I love that stuff. Me, I, I think that it's probably my favorite thing, or one of my favorite things to look at. It, it get, it like stimulates me. It makes me feel like. There's an itch that I have to scratch that I don't know. It's like satisfying to look at, and I, I was really? wondering. Yeah, I was. I was wondering what kind of gravitated you towards that material. Like, why you use that material so much? Like, what? I guess what does it represent to, uh, in your work? I could tell you how I started using it. I was in um, a friend of mine at the time, uh, a sculptor, an artist named Will Ryman. I was in his studio. I was going through a divorce, and that stuff is it's armature mesh. Mm. It's what you put underneath sculptures. You, you mm -hmm. sculpt with it, all right? And he had a roll there, and I put it on my head because I'm always sort of making weird, you know, using industrial materials and stuff around my studio to do self-portraits. But uh, I started putting that on my face, and I I think the same with you. It, there was something about it that was wicked, sexy, uh, yeah. hurt. It hurt. It pinches. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. I get that from looking at it. I'm like, oh, it's like, I like this. Yeah, my friends, <laughs> I've got very, very indulgent friends and in that they let me, I, I tried to fold the little wire sticking out so mm -hmm. they didn't prong them, but uh -huh. they, those things hurt. Yeah. Um, but they were, oh my God, you could make the most, did I say I was into sci-fi? I mean, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was, uh, I was, I was thinking about Lady Macbeth and the Uncanny Valley at the same time. Uh -huh. And that just sort of satisfied that, you know, um, it took you out of the realm. A lot of science fiction and fantasy, you go somewhere else to look back at the reality of what we have here. Mm -hmm. The best, the I best. Th I think Watchmen did a great Time job. Travel. A great job. Yes. That. Yes. That's what like The Handmaid's Tale, yes, Margaret Atwood. Yeah. I mean, 
Octavia Butler, every single piece she does, mm -hmm. Ursula K. Le Guin, mm -hmm. Light is the Left Hand of Darkness. I mean, you know, the, the best of them, that's what they do. Uh, so that's where that came from. And I just started playing with it, and I would buy rolls of it. I still have it all over my, you can't see it from here, but all over my studio, I still have like heads with these things on them. I'm like, I should really, if I ever move, I'm going to have to flatten them all. Mm. You know, I thought I, you know. But that's that's what that stuff is. You know, you take wire cutters and you start to play. Yeah. And it's just fantastical. You know, it's whatever your mind does. It is you know, really like great. I said, it's the underpinning for sculptures. So it's used for a lot of stuff. I just used it as it was. Hmm. Amazing. Very cool. Yeah. I really I, I really like I, I enjoyed looking I spent like a couple of hours just look scrolling through your website and Oh looking at your work. Nice. I, was I like, got a good sound guy, Grace. <laughs> I, it was just, uh, yeah, I, you know, I don't know. Some, I found your work, uh, slightly like it can like shocking, maybe a little frightening. Um, it actually made me think like, if you, are you into like scary things? Like, do you like things that are like scary? I think that maybe the things I find scary aren't the things most people find scary. Uh -huh. I think there might be something a little skewed because what I find scary, along with water bugs, um, isn't <laughs> water bugs are frightening. It's 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 more dealing with people, you know, or doing something like this is terrifying for me. Uh, oh well, you did a great job, so you don't have to be afraid. Yeah, no, it, it's like trying to commit words writing to paper is to me is is a horror show. Mm. Um, being vulnerable on paper, putting your words down so someone could judge whether you're smart or not. This is in my own head. Mm -hmm. You know, that's this is leftover childhood stuff that I've been fighting forever. Um, so I guess my work, w what I'm attracted to, I like dark sides. I think it's exciting. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I guess, yeah. It, it's that yin-yang, that push-pull. I mean, sensuality, sublimity. It comes out of both. It's the marriage of both. That's why Pandora's box is such a snapshot of these, especially right now. I'm hoping the last throw up vomit of, of the genocide and imperialism, colonialism this country is kind of built on, that misogyny and racism, it's and all of us are, are part of it. We have to fight it in ourselves too. We all have we all incorporate our cultures. But yes, going forward, it fe feels like the feminine way, which is not, to me, feminism isn't, it, it's not just women. It's a way of life, just like what's going on now, you know? And it's so, I mean, the collective, the idea of the collective, the idea of everybody, you know? Yeah, it does seem so much more female. Where you, And that's why I think there's more and more females coming to the fore, because we're the ones that have spent years learning how to do all this. Well, you, well, you learn when you have to. Yeah, so and I mean, from being mothers, from being this, from being from, you know, it's like you, you, you learn how to just do it harder and longer. Again, not knocking the guys, but it's, and, and it needs to be everybody together. But Zadie Smith, it's, I think it's in this week's New Yorker, wrote this article. She, um, she interviewed her, Toyin Otoy, T-O-Y-I-N is her first name. She's an artist, look her up and you'll get the rest of it. But Zadie Smith ends the interview with this. The dream of Franz Fanon, who I'm not sure what, who he is, was not the replacement of one unjust power with another unjust power. It was a re revolutionary humanism, neither assimilationist nor supremacist, in which the Manichaean logic of dominant submissive as it applies to people is finally and completely dismantled. And the right of every being to its dignity is recognized. That is decolonization. So it's not females on top, males on top. Mm. I mean, it's, it's, I, I, there was a quote by Dr. Vivian Gordon, I think. I read this quote somewhere. I believe that was her name. I think I read it in a paper that was written in 1992. But she was saying about feminism that the white women are telling the white men, move over. We're sharing power. And she was saying that the black women, this isn't the, the quote, I'm not quoting it quite right. Black women are saying to the white women, no, the structure is wrong. This is what's happening now. The structure was wrong. The structure, we have a chance right now to kind of start over. It's being ripped yeah. apart. You know, we're either all going to fall off a cliff and die or Rise it has together. to be something else. Yes. Yeah. 
I think one yes. of the biggest lies we're told is a freedom fighter. Like, you don't fight for freedom. Freedom is love. You have to love into freedom. You can't fight into freedom. Um, and that, to me, is like love comes with a lot of elements of forgiveness, a lot of elements of letting go. Yeah. Not taking not taking insults and holding on to them. Yes. Yeah, you have to just, you know, you have to, like, come... I mean, as the feminine is like the earth or whatever that is, like a, a grounding experience, you have to let it go back into this cycle and then manifest the energy or transcend the energy differently. Rise well, that, to the occasion. That's your practice, too. Yeah. Well, you've had a long career. Is there any advice that you wish you were given as a young artist? Is there any advice you would give to the future generation of artists? Oh, fuck yeah. Mentors. <laughs> mentors, yeah. mentors, mentors. I never... I, th I ch chose badly with mentors, mentors, female mentors for, I mean, find someone, find Bantors. someone who's where you want to be and make friends with them. Just older, older, you know, and be smart about it. it, it it's like finding a therapist. I've, I've never gone to therapy, but I've heard that you have to search for the right one. Otherwise you're listening to really bad advice. Yeah. Or you're listening or looking at a cracked mirror that doesn't really show you what you're looking at. Yeah, and and learn how to write. Oh, learn how to be really, really good tough. on paper. You know, I just I, I I came out of school when it was just like paint, paint, paint. You know, and I'm telling you, from I'm in awe of a lot of what I read by the younger women and doing this project. I'm just like everyone that's got their shit together has got their shit together on paper. It's all together. Anyway, I think art going forward. It's like there's a lot of performative active, not performative activism. There's a lot of activist art, art that you don't, that is, that's why I love performance art. So I think Martha Wilson's so brilliant for, for, for shepherding it and keeping it and getting those grants to people. I've never been a performance artist. That being said, I think everything is performative. Everything you do and the work is almost like the last part. You know, so now a lot of the actual physical artwork is being cut out. I mean, it's just, it's going forward. It's, I don't know what I'm saying. I just went off. I don't have a tangent. But, yeah. All right, Grace. Thank all right, you darling. so much. Thank, thank you for you the so opportunity. Much. I'm glad you guys are all good. And thank you for being so gracious and patient. And I love your questions. And Oh, please. This was great. I really, I really yeah, enjoyed talking to you. You're great. <laughs> I love having these check-ins with you during the pandemic, too. Because we've been on the phone quite a, a little bit. And it's, it's comforting. I appreciate it you in my life well, thank you yeah thank you and same same all right grace take, take care. care all right bye bye bye